the whole notion of uh, doing good while getting rich came up in the in the earlier panel uh, in, in case you're wondering where where I got you know integrated into into this panel and moderation and so on uh, I my background is in social entrepreneurship I have been a social entrepreneur my entire life and career and uh, I have been uh, privileged to work with uh, with social enterprises and social entrepreneurs around the world uh, and a lot in India and South Asia as well uh, so I have been helping access capital for so, for social good and different causes and so uh, so this topic is is close to my heart and close to me from the social side so I'm very very privileged to be uh, to be sitting with these gentlemen and talking to them about uh, money and capital and so on but uh, I'm not going to really uh, dwell into their bios because if you you know we all have uh, we all have the booklets and we've been browsing through that all morning but you know what a distinguished panel we have here and you know, I, I think I think we can use that extra time to engage in some Q and A, which we have been cutting short in almost every panel. So I'm going to jump right in. And again, thank you, Ray. Thank you, Rodney. And thank you, Prabha, for uh, for uh, uh, offering your valuable time uh, to this uh, to this audience. I'm going to ask, request each one of them to spend five minutes, uh, uh, you know, giving some broad opening remarks about about this uh, very, very broad topic, very wide topic, you know, uh, about accessing capital. You know, what are the trials and the triumphs, the joys and sorrows of trying to access capital? Uh, I'm going to ask each of them to, to talk for about five minutes and give us some opening thoughts. Do you want me to go first? Or start? Uh, no, Ray, why don't you start, please? Okay. Terrific. Um, yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out on a on a Saturday. Although uh, the weather cooperated with us, if it were worse, if it were nicer weather, you might not be here. So um, let me just say a few things a, a, about this um, topic, um, this search for money, um, for lack of another way. Um, there are just some basics, some basics to keep in mind. Um, one of the interesting uh, headlines in the news. Uh, last week was that the last quarter, in the last quarter in the U.S., was a record uh, in terms of the amount of venture money um, that went for uh, startups. It was an absolute record-breaking amount. So there are billions of dollars now flowing into startups. Um, but the startup world is changing a little bit. So you've got phases of money. And one of the things that's important to think about is what phase your idea or your business is in, and then pursuing the right source of money for the phase that you're in. It doesn't do you any good to be a startup uh, entity and then immediately to run into somebody from private equity that's really positioned to look to take somebody to a higher scale and is a mature company and you're not a mature company. So you would be wasting your time and their time. So I think it's the first point is to assess what phase your business or your idea is in. Once you have a clear understanding of where you are, then it's mapping out the supply of capital. And then the next thing becomes getting your pitch together, your verbal pitch and your written pitch. And remember, very simply, when someone's doing an analysis of what you're doing, you can really reduce it to three things. They're going to assess people, they're going to assess the product, and they're going to assess the market. And those are the three things. And so you want to make sure that you're being self-critical of all three of those things. I always look for people that really understand their market. You know, if someone is coming in and they have an idea and you're sitting on the investor side and you know twice more about the market than, than, they, than they know, what do you think the chances of, of them putting money into you? They're almost zero. Um, and then, of course, they're going to analyze the product. And then one of the most important things is the you part. You know, and they've got to sit there and put like a frame around it and go, I think he or she can pull this off. And if you go in there, and I often say to people, make it interesting, make it fun. If you kind of go in there and drone on, I've got an idea, this is what I want to do, and you're boring the person on the other end, they're not likely to want to meet with you again. So I'm big on saying, make it interesting, make it fun. And years ago when I started, 
um, an entity called One Economy, and I was going out to get money, the other thing that that reminds me of is how many times people are going to say no. And so you have got to be able to handle the no and to not lose sight and the sense of self-belief. And so one of the most important things is believing in yourself and believing in your product, and that's going to get tested. There's going to be a lot of times where you're going to think, wow, you know, I mean, your confidence is going to be uh, a dented. And I used to tell my team, and we started with four people in a basement and then eventually grew to work in 17 countries and have 120 people. But when I was getting started and we were working in the basement, we just kept saying, we've got to keep digging away and digging away. And we had an expression. And we said, we have to exude an air of inevitability. We had to believe that it was inevitable, that our success was going to be inevitable. And that would give off this aura to other people. So when they looked at us, they too got caught up in that vision. Because remember, at the end of the day, you're telling a story, a beginning, a middle, an end. So everything has a narrative to it. And so when you have that opportunity to get in front of somebody, tell a story, talk about the narrative, and show off who you are and have that air of inevitability and self-belief. But those are just some, some opening remarks. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Rodney? Thank you. I'd also like to thank everyone for being here. Uh, Saturday afternoon is not a popular time uh, to be anywhere other than out having fun. So you, you must consider this fun or you may not be here. So uh, nonetheless, I appreciate it. Also, being the last panel, uh, I appreciate your, your patience uh, and time. Hopefully, uh, we'll add value. I certainly think Ray has already let us off. Um, and I, we've already seen uh, from the gentleman to my left, so we know that these guys will add value. Uh, my role in the panel was to be the other side of that, uh, to balance this out so there's good and there's bad, so uh, just to set expectations properly. Um, but uh, thank you again uh, also for the organizers to be here. So from my perspective, I would add on a couple of things here, and, I, and this is something that I think is, is interesting, and, and to maybe follow into the comment about the amount of money that's being raised right now in, the, in the, the venture capital space. Part of that is also driven by what the dynamics have, uh, have changed in, in, in that market. So if you, what, what's happened in Sarbanes-Oxley and the things that happened after the tech boom uh, and then eventually bust is that the, the regulations got a lot more stringent for companies going public. So what, what has happened is a lot of companies have then delayed uh, going public. So you, you see companies go from private to Fortune 500 uh, when they list. Facebook uh, is you know, a re more recent example that I'm sure everyone's familiar with. And so Facebook probably would have went public a lot younger in its career had it gone public, let's say, in the 90s. Um, so that, that dynamic has changed. And you can see companies like Uber, uh, Airbnb, and you can, this is a trend. Part of that is a regulatory uh, framework that has driven a lot of those companies to continue to raise private funds as opposed to public funds. So some of, some of the numbers are, are likely um, you know, driven by some of the regulatory changes that you have to account for. Nonetheless, I agree 100%. If you have ideas now, you should be out in the market looking for people to fund you because right now there's a lot of capital out there and certainly uh, you should have a desire to access that capital in the short term because there are cycles. Uh, the money will not always be like this uh, and it will be like this again at some point. You don't know when that is going to be. So as an entrepreneur, you should be very focused on finding those people now. Uh, if you have an idea or if you have the idea to get funding, you should be out looking for funding now. At the same time, you know, getting your pitch book together, these things are all important. And we've talked about these uh, on some other panels. More critical than any of those things is just uh, what came up on the last panel. The best way to raise money for any entrepreneur is to build your business and build your business better. What you want to be when you go into pitch is this, you know, if someone is going to invest in your business, they want the air of inevitability. They want, they want to know that this business is working and whether they fund it or not, that you go on. It's not an idea on the back of a napkin. And some of those get funded, by the way, so shouldn't maybe uh, totally disparage those. But the idea is that you're saying, well, we're executing on our strategy. We're doing this. We have five people, seven people full time executing right now. We're doing this. If you fund us or if you don't fund us, we're going to continue on. I'm presenting you with an opportunity. You know, investors obviously want to hear about that, but investors certainly want to hear about how you're executing. If you're not executing, you're really not selling anything other than an idea. And I, and I agree with uh, one of the panelists earlier, I think it was you I'd mentioned, uh, ideas are essentially a dime a dozen, uh, to use a, 
an idiom, but there are very little value. There are very few ideas uh, that have value as a standalone. What creates the value around those ideas is execution. And if you can demonstrate that you're executing, even uh, if it's at a smaller scale, which also came up in the last panel, if you're demonstrating that you can execute at the smaller scale, people can understand, well, we can make this scalable. We can ramp this up. We can do these things. But if these people don't have the chops to execute even here, why would I invest in them to execute with another $5 million? You're, you're not going to do that. And another piece that I would, would add, and I'll stop after this comment, you know, another thing that I should have shared at the beginning, one of the most dangerous places in the room is me, between me and the microphone, so I'll, uh, I'll try to keep my remarks briefer. But one of the things that uh, people should uh, have uh, as an entrepreneur when they're looking for funding is be self-aware. Uh, and I think Ray had talked about this a little bit too. Be self-aware. Know what your strengths are. Know what your weaknesses are. Double down on your strengths, and we, we can talk about that again, too. But be self-aware. Know what you want to do. Know the market that you should be playing in. Know what the supply of that capital looks like. Uh, and get out there and start executing before you get out there and start looking for money. Okay, Paul, over to you. Yeah. So basically, uh, <clears throat> funding, you know, there are two kinds of business. You know, if you take first entrepreneurship, people have a little bit difference of opinion. Or, or have a wrong perception between doing a business and being an entrepreneur. If you're an entrepreneur, money is a byproduct. If you're doing a business, you have an opportunistic time bounded. You're buying something, you're selling something, you have, you're seeing a problem that requires a service with your ability and a team and making that. So you need to f really differentiate yourself. Are you a service business or are you a product business? Not every company is fundable. So that will distinguish between the services business or a product business. But every company can be bootstrapped. In fact, before funding, you must bootstrap, put your skin in the game, and make sure you can increase the value of the company on ongoing basis. And when you want to scale up, you will get the, uh, you will look for funding. That is the core principle of any funding. I bootstrapped the company for three years. After I got 3,000 customers, I went and raised not even um, Series A or a VC money, but um, um, seed money. You know, even after three years, I raised only seed money to bring some of the credible investors to be on the board, uh, just to have their skin in the game. I also mentor a lot of uh, entrepreneurs to raise money. I do invest as a seed investor in uh, some of the um, uh, emerging technology startups and help companies to raise money too. There are different kinds of money, right? Seed money, angel money, Series A, and then uh, private equ equity funding, uh, also loans, and all kinds, different sorts of money. You need to identify what kind of money that you need. And you, you should know what kind of money that your business need. So those are the things, you know, every, every company cannot be fundable. First, take that, nobody's going to fund you, and you have to run your business of your own. Put that in mind, then the money will come. When you want to go and raise money, they call it growth funding, right? How do you ident identify whether you, your company is ready for growth funding? Here is my analogy that usually I give. Take a $100 bill, put it in a color copier, right? Switch on. The moment you get the funding, your company value should increase like printing or Copier, you know, it keep on giving you $100 every second. Your company value should go like that. Then only you can attract growth funding. So the moment, you know, you get the funding, your company should grow like that. Until you see your company can, your value can grow like that, don't go for growth funding. It will never happen. So that's my few inputs. Uh, thanks, Prabha. Uh, Prabha, you already kind of uh, led us into the, to the, to the, to my, my second question, uh, the different kinds of monies and who should access what and why. Uh, again, it's a very, very broad topic, but, uh, but I'm going to ask uh, our panelists to talk about, you know, there is no one size fits all approach here. Why, what kind of lens should we be wearing in terms of accessing what type of money? Uh, what, are, what are some insights? What are some, some things to keep in mind while identifying which kind of money to source and why? Can we, can we uh, get some thoughts on that, uh, in, in not necessarily in the same order, but anyone, but, but we want all of the, all the three of you to, to comment on that. 
I'll, I'll jump in first then. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll talk about one aspect of this and to leave it open uh, for other comments as well. But uh, my comments will, will not be tailored toward any specific type. I think Ray had mentioned you, you should be thinking about the type of money, uh, whether it's startup. Again, you can get an idea funded at a napkin, and that's the kind of funding deal need if you're looking for an angel investor as an example, very different from if you're a fully uh, functioning company with, uh, with, with profits and, and growing, then growth capital is more appropriate. And if you're even more established, you're looking at private equity. Uh, but uh, to one of the points that came up on, on the last panel too, uh, it's not just the type uh, of the funding, it's, it's who it's coming from, right? And, and you had mentioned this on the last panel, you know, you have to be very careful about when, you, when you're selling a stake in your company, right? You're, you're taking on a partner. Uh, investors are partners. Uh, now, they, some of these partners may have different objectives than you do, uh, and this is where you need to be self-aware as well. You need to understand, if you're going to be taking money from, from whatever this group is, that your objectives are aligned. Because if they are not at the beginning, they cer there will certainly be a time when it's very clear that they are not. Uh, that might not be tomorrow, but it might be six months and it might be a year from now. If you have an investor that has an anticipation that they're going to take money out of your business in six months or out of the business that they've invested in, and you have an idea that you're going to be doubling down on development costs at that same time, well, you have an impasse there. So you need to make sure that you're on the same page with those investors and you're bringing in a real partner. Um, and you should, you should be doing the work and your homework and the due diligence on the, on the people uh, that you're trying to get money from. You should be interviewing them as much as you're interview they're interviewing you. So it should be a two-sided equation. Uh, like any good relationship in life, uh, if it's not a two-way street, it's not likely to work in the long term. So partnership, I think, is very critical. Uh, alignment of interest and just making sure that expectations on both sides of that equation is understood at the beginning and expectations of how that money is going to help the business and, and when that money is likely to be paid back. Some, some investors have an expectation of a very quick turnaround and others are much, long much more long-term oriented. Uh, and again, expectations need to be set at the beginning and you should be looking for partners, not just investors. Yeah, I'll just, um, I'm not gonna add too much to that because I, I think you really uh, covered it. And, and just a, a simple way of thinking about it is remember, and I often talk about this, it's sort of a dichotomy, relationships versus transactions. And this is about a relationship, it's not merely a transaction. And so we just reflect on the difference between a relationship and a transaction and, and just know which one you're involved with. And, and a relationship is about the long term. And so I, I think he eloquently sort of laid that out. And, and you're going to be married for a while and you want to make sure it fits because just getting money expediently and it doesn't fit is going to be a bad uh, um, breakup. I've got some other things I want to talk about, but I'll wait until we get to the, uh, to the next phase. Um, quick few inputs. Um, external money is very expensive. So first you should understand that external money, how that external money is coming in. Uh, say example, a VC firm or a private equity firm, how do they get the money to invest on the companies that in, you know, entrepreneurs are looking for? They go and get other investors, they, you know, individually or even some of them are accessing funds like, you know, say pension funds or corporate money. All of them are looking for a growth. So if assuming that or you know, anybody who in a 401k, they are investing money in mutual funds, some of that money is coming to the private equity as well as venture firms because they want to invest that money as a risk capital so that they can get 10 times, 20 times and pay a big dividend. So obviously your spouse working in a, a big corporation putting in a 401k is coming back to you through uh, the VC form or a PE form. So you have to earn them a big rewards. And it will be, it will, their expectation is very high. So unless your company, the product that you are going to create an exponential value for the investors, accessing that money will be difficult. So imagine you are an investor and you will invest in a different company. What are the questions you will think? What are the risk factors you will consider? Put that all in perspective of your company, will you take that risk to put your own money if you have $5 million? That will answer your question whether and what level you are uh, to get funding. 
Thank you. I, I, I would actually request Ray to uh, elaborate uh, on his thoughts, and, and I also want him to go a little deeper into the relationship versus transaction uh, uh, trail of thought and, and, and the other uh, follow-up thoughts he had. Thank you for that. I, I want to um, just simplify a couple of, a couple of things here. Um, just for, for you to take away when you're, th when you're thinking about this, because we've spent some time talking about knowing what type of source of capital that you're looking for. But I, I just want to go back to your story, your narrative, and a few of the things that you've got to get across from the person on the other side of, of the table. Um, and, and I'm just going to lay this out. It's just a few very simple things. The first thing is, is being able to describe what your business is. Now, that may seem um, so basic. But, and I'm sure you've had this experience, you will be amazed by people who will come in, will be all over the place, and can't really adequately describe the business that they're in. So I think it's very, very important to practice that pitch and to be able to articulate to family, friends, and then outsiders what your, what your business is. But the second point is really perhaps the most critical, and that gets to being able to articulate and show what's known as your value proposition. Your, your value proposition. So think about what you do and then ask yourself the critical question, why is this of value? And when you're thinking about that, think about a few other things that go along with it. So value, what does that mean, value creation? Well, you can, you can get value by, by laying out a, a product, a service, or a process that because of the innovation of it, because you're disrupting an existing market, because you're going to do something at scale, because it's sustainable, and because there's an exit for the investor. Some of those things that I've just mentioned are part of what are going to drive value. And, and value is directly related to the return calculation that the investor is going to look at. They're going to weigh the risk and they're going to look at the return calculation. But they're going to be able to understand that there's a value proposition looking at what you're proposing and then stepping back. So, so I've had people bring ideas, and then you're waiting for that moment when it's like telling a story, that aha moment where the person goes, ah, I see the value. There's a special innovation here. There's something that's going to disrupt the marketplace. There's something that's going to create a pivot. And so you need that moment in your story where the person's listening, okay, okay, I got that, I got that, I got that. And then there's this pivot to this, to this value proposition. And then the last point, so again, what's your business, what your value proposition is, and then lastly, why you? Why you? And be able to articulate that, whether it's because of your passion, whether it's because of your experience, or your special insight into that area. If you can do those things, you're going to dramatically increase your opportunity for someone to say yes to you. So I just wanted to get that across in a very, very succinct way.